Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to our week ahead. I'm Ben. I'm stepping in for Andrew this week. We have Dominique, as per usual, our, our US economist. Uh, it's been a hectic week, Dominique. Uh, what has been all over the shop? He's, he's, he's kind of retraced his steps from a month ago. At least that's what markets are, are, are portraying. Why, why, why don't we kick things off and, and get your take on, on Wallace's comments and where the Fed stand now? Yeah, a bit, a bit unusual, but I can't complain about Waller. He's keeping me uh, employed. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, the Fed uh, turned uh, dovish on us. Uh, so Waller uh, not only commenting on short-term data, which is quite unusual, what the Fed does is actually look at the totality of the data rather than the last few data points. And I guess... For some reason, Waller decided to focus on the uh, retail sales, the PMI, which were a bit weak. And then, of course, there was his comment about cuts, that there would be cuts if inflation slowed down, which, of course, the market loved and I suspect will end up generating, again, a lot of unnecessary volatility. Um, but, but what I think is going on here uh, is that Basically, the Fed has been trying to convey that uh, the combination of uh, slowing inflation and low unemployment we had reflected positive supply uh, shocks that were not going to last. So you had that. And then, you know, you've had this increase in unemployment, uh, which has the FOMC worried, rightly so in my view. Uh, that the economy uh, is slowing. Uh, there is even this uh, law devised by Claudia Sam, Sam's rule, that says that when unemployment increases by more than 50 basis points, we're usually in recession. I personally don't think that the economy uh, is, is slowing or that we are headed to recession. Uh, but, you know, the Fed is supposed to pay attention to the data. It's, uh, and so it's it's totally justified that they would be worried. It's just that uh, uh, the messaging, you know, when you are a FOMC member or member of the board of governor and you say something, it has huge market impact. So usually uh, Fed speakers are a little more measured uh, in their messaging. But as I said, this is keeping me uh, gainfully employed. And do you think heading into the blackout that obviously starts this weekend, do you think Powell, and I should state we're, we're, we're recording this a couple of hours prior to, to Powell's Friday speech, do you think Powell will try to walk back some of what the market's done and, and put some clarity on, on the Fed and say, look, cuts aren't going to probably happen in the first quarter of next year or even May of next year? Yeah, I, very much so. Though uh, Powell is not driven by price action, is more driven by economic data. And I think he will once again say we cannot take it for granted that inflation, disinflation is going to continue. And I don't think the market will listen to him anyway. The only thing that will uh, change the market mood is the announcement of hikes or some change in the SCP that shows two cuts next year, uh, say if those cuts were to be removed, yeah, that would hit the market. But more talk that we can't be sure we are not going to hike again. I don't think this is going to, in, to impress markets very much. And just so all our listeners can, can understand where you're coming from, what is your 2024 outlook for the, uh, for the Fed? So I don't think they'll cut, and uh, essentially because I think growth is going to surprise everybody, and we, yeah, I think it will remain uh, above trend. Uh, this is an election year, fiscal policy. We can talk about this not going to get tightened. Look at how at the recovery in the residential market, the strength of durable consumption. Policy, monetary policy is not getting transmitted. So in my view, we get a uh, growth above trend and we get sticky inflation. And I'm going to really stick my head above the parapet and argue that we could even see more uh, hikes next year. But we don't need to talk about that. We can focus on the cuts. I, Based on my economic outlook, I don't see them. 
well, bold claim uh, versus what the market are pricing. And to, to, to wrap up this week on the Fed, did you take much from the Beige Book this time round? So I was surprised because the Beige Book is an exercise in nuance. They tell us growth had somewhat moderated or growth uh, in, increased to some in some district. And the first sentence in the Beige Book was growth weakened, which is unusually uh, strong. Uh, and by the way, the tone of the Beige Book has nothing to do uh, with the GDP ever. So I think there was a deliberate attempt to convey that the FOMC is concerned about the economic outlook, which is in line with Waller turning, you know, from a wolf into a sheep, or what is expression of wolf in a sheep clothing, turning from a hawk into a, a dove. So yeah, I was surprised. And I think the fears are not justified. And I mean, stayed on GDP, what did you take from the GDP release this week alongside some of the, the promising signs we saw from the Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals that seem to suggest that households uh, remain resilient at the moment? Uh, 100%. And the US economy is 70% consumption. So household is really what's driving the show. Um, in terms of the GDP release, there wasn't much that is new there. Uh, one uh, data I'm following closely is the Atlanta Fed now cast. I think it's just a very good aggregator of macro data. It's down this week, 1.8%. But you know the thing about macro data, uh, what goes up must come down and vice versa. Lots of uh, noise there. We are only uh, two thirds of the way uh, through the uh, fourth quarter. Um, and I would argue that uh, broadly speaking, the macro data is following my expectation, which is growth above trend, but of course much slower than what we had in Q3. Perfect. And, and, and if I could just say a, a word about the cyber cyber week, I mean, online sales up 8% when we have zero core good inflation. That's strong. Uh, and then if you look at the con consumer balance sheet, believe it or not, uh, household debt relative to household income is lower than it was before the pandemic. So I'm not saying that piling on debt is great, but from a macro perspective, from a purely uh, positive perspective, plenty of room to do more of that, and that's going to keep the US economy humming. And to, to, to round off this week, what did you take from PCE? Is, did you, is, there, uh, any star, is there any star from that? Uh, PCE, you know, it comes after the CPI. There are a lot of commonalities. Uh, so we had the, the same story. Basically, what happened uh, in um, uh, October uh, is that uh, we had a decline in energy prices. Uh, core inflation is very sensitive to energy prices. So we had a low PC, CPI, PC number. And it's going to be the same in November because once again, energy prices uh, have come down. I mean, gas prices have come down. Um, and that's just an example of the positive supply shocks that uh, Powell has been talking about. And like Chair Powell, I agree, it's not going to last forever. So you just need to be patient here. Perfect. So let's let, let's move on to, to next week. We're, we're going to land in the black where well, it will be blackout next week. Um, so it's really the data that markets will be paying attention to. We have the NFP. Some people call it the, the random number generator. Um, what, what will you be looking <laughs> for uh, at the NFP? And will jobless claims and, and jobs give you any hints or, or are you looking for anything in particular with those three releases? So jobless claim, it's a very noisy, poor quality data, high frequency, and historically, it's more a coincidence than a lagging indicator. So the headline NFP, to me, seems very reasonable, 200K. This is uh, uh, the NFP, the first NFP without the impact of the, of the strike, of course. Um, what will be of interest to me, uh, unemployment, because it has been such a source of worry. Uh, and I think it's going to get revised down because the unemployment uh, last month, the 10 basis point increase, reflected the contraction in employment in the household survey, which is a low, high, very noisy survey. I think it's going to get uh, uh, revised down, which should you know reassure pe people who are worried about the SAMS rule. 
Um, also, wage growth, uh, uh, not great, uh, 4% year on year, but that still makes it positive on a real basis. And again, if you look at the trend in real wages, they are increasing. And again, this is completely in line with, with uh, uh, historical averages in the sense that whenever there is an inflation surprise, uh, wages adjust with a lag. So you initially have a decline in real wages and then they catch up. And so that's what I'm expecting. And uh, so I, I'm I'm comfortable with the consensus forecast. And will NFP, will the NFP outturn have any impact on what happens in December with the Fed? How the, or, or is that too late for them to even consider? So they will consider it. Uh, I don't think on its own uh, it's enough uh, to impact uh, their decision. So they are on hold. Uh, probably not enough to impact the SCP, uh, which I think is probably going to be unchanged given the uncertainty. I mean, in terms of uh, of uh, Fed hikes. Uh, as always, I reserve the right to change my mind based on the data I haven't put out my full NFP preview uh, yet. Uh, the thing that's uh, more interesting is going to be the November CPI, which is on the uh, Tuesday, uh, so the first day of the meeting. But again, with uh, gas prices going down in November, as they have, I think we'll also have a, a low number. So nothing to uh, stir the apple cart uh, here. So the, the next data point, Ben, that of course I, I and everybody else will be looking at is the services PMI. <clears throat> we had a, a dip the past two months. Uh, the consensus is a small recovery, which makes sense because again, the bottom line is a, in the US is a consumer. As long as you know they are consuming, everything is fine. So um, it looks like we had a little bit of an air pocket in October. Remember all that talk about uh, student debt repayment and how it was going to crush the US economy and trigger the next recession? That didn't happen, but you know, I didn't see it in the consumption numbers, but it's still possible that uh, it caused a bit of a, of a temporary uh, weakness. And I expect that uh, to, to, to get resolved. Uh, and so the PMI, uh, it makes sense for me that we we would see a, a small recovery. And then to to round off next week, we fit we finished with the the Michigan survey. The what are your expectations there? How how does that lay into your Fed plans? What are your your Fed expectations and uh, what do you think markets will take from that? Okay, so the survey um, it's important as a predictor of uh, um, a durable consumption. That's what it correlates with the most. But in reality, you know, and there has been some academic work done on this, surveys reflect a partisan affiliation uh, of people sur surveyed. So I find that uh, uh, durable good consumption itself is a better prediction of uh, consumer behavior and a better indi indication of, of consumer confidence than the confidence surveys themselves. However, what is interesting in there is uh, inflation expectations, and they've been going up, even the short term, the one year. Uh, expectation has been going up in the Michigan survey, despite you know the decline in oil prices uh, over the past couple of months. So um, that's what I'll be uh, looking at. Is there any uh, reversal of this, this increased uh, inflation expectations? One last thing I'd like to mention: uh, we're going to get the fourth quarter uh, consumer uh, flow of fund data, which is basically all the data about the balance sheet and asset. Issue uh, financial asset issuance and purchases in the, the U.S. economy. And one thing I will be looking for um, is a loan category and a decrease in the share of banks in a total loan creation, because we are hearing a lot of talk about private credit. And the problem I have is that I am not seeing it in the data, the share of uh, banks in total loan issuance is actually going up, which makes me wonder if the Fed uh, data is actually capturing all of the private credit boom 
uh, that we are hearing about. It may not, um, and it's a bit worrying. Now, I thought perhaps let's 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 end this uh, this weekly with a with something particularly spicy for 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 our listeners. Um, we like to do Grace ones at Macro Hive. I know you're looking at the elections uh, in your Grace one. Can you give a a little preview of what you might write and what you you think is a, is your Grace one there? Um, I would rather keep it under wrap. <laughs> uh, on the politics, I'll just say one thing. You know, I've been saying that it's too late to to have more fiscal brinkmanship, you know, because the Republicans control the House. Uh, they could shut down the government in January and February when current funding expires. And I didn't think they would because we are too close to the election. If they shut down the government, you will just turn off voters and lower the chances of the Republicans next year. And surprise, surprise, the uh, hard wing of the Republican Party in the House has announced that basically they are happy with the deal that was struck between the administration and the Republicans at the time of the debt ceiling negotiation uh, in June, uh, which means basically they are not going to close the government. We are going to have a series of CR until after the elections. So no fiscal consolidation in an election year, which, you know, is totally in line with past experience. Now, Dominique, I mean, you're the US expert here. Perhaps I've missed anything. Is there anything else we need to cover for the for the week ahead? No, nothing important. Um, I mean, these are the, the essentials, really. Perfect. Uh, so with that, we'll wrap up the week ahead. Um, and thanks for listening. Thanks, Ben. It's been great chatting with you. Thank you. See ya.